welcome you all here today. This is really a special event. You're going to be glad that you are here. My name is Julie Rosa. I'm the First Amendment specialist here at the Greenlee School. And today we have a very special presentation that is part of our First Amendment series. And so uh, honor student Eva Newland has been doing some research into an interesting aspect of privacy called the right to be forgotten. And she's been doing her research as a part of a class, but she is now ready to present some of her findings to an, a larger audience. So with that being said, Eva, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Like Julie said, my name is Eva Newland. I'm a sophomore here at Greenlee. I'm majoring in journalism. Uh, I am currently taking uh, Journalism 460, which is media law. And for that class, we have to write a research paper and explore a current media issue. Um, it can't be really something that has been decided. Uh, we have to look at the law, um, take our opinion out of it, and kind of make a case for how we think it should be interpreted based on what we've learned in the class. So I am exploring the right to be forgotten. You might say, Eva. What is that? Don't worry, I've got a 15 minute presentation all about it, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> okay, so for this presentation, we have to take a side. And I am going to be arguing that the right to be forgotten is inherently unconstitutional because it is so intertwined with the First Amendment. Um, Julie has taught us to be kind of First Amendment absolutist, <laughs> but in this case, the law is on our side. So we're going to talk a little bit about why. First off, what is the right to be forgotten? The right to be forgotten has been around for a long time. Um, this term specifically has actually been used since the 1800s. So um, it's also called the right to rehabilitation. Uh, in a modern context, how I examined it is whether or not we should have the ability to erase parts of our digital footprint. For those of you that don't know, a digital footprint is anything you do on the internet ever. It's recorded, anything you search, anything you post, anything you do, even just looking at your computer, the tiny camera actually tracks your eye movement. And that's all part of your digital footprint too. So I wanted to look and say, well, should this really be permanent? And because we are kind of the first generation growing up in the internet, the law doesn't really have a clear answer yet. Now, those of you that are legal experts will know <laughs> about um, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis. He actually started thinking about the right to be forgotten in the 1800s and he published a pamphlet with his friend Warren. Um, I don't know if they were actually friends, maybe more colleagues, but they said this, whether the existing law afforded a principle which could properly be invoked to protect the privacy of the individual, and if it did, what the nature and extent of such protection. Now, Brandeis was an intellectual and probably had a bit of a superiority complex. So this is kind of confusing when we look at it. But basically, what he's saying is maybe there should be a way to forget about certain things that happen, but I don't want to actually do anything with the law for it. So this theme is present through a lot of our history. But let's take a little break from America, talk about Europe. Europe actually does have an established right to be forgotten. It uh, was established through case ruling, just like law is established here. So as you can see by my lovely map, right to be forgotten. No right to be forgotten. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> so the, the important thing to remember when talking about Europe is there is no Bill of Rights in Europe. So there is no First Amendment that they have protections, but it's not explicitly stated the same way that we are used to in America. So when you look at European cases, 
you have to remember that they don't have this same level and they don't have that dedication to freedom of speech. But the big question for both of us is the balance between privacy and expression. So kind of like the Supreme Court, the Court of Justice of the European Union are kind of the big dogs. They uh, have a lot of say. So when they investigated the right to be forgotten, they said this, the retention or remembering of every action of every person using the internet has the potential to adversely affect people on and offline. And the consequences of unchecked data retention range from reputational harm to harm that is severe and sometimes shocking. Ooh, they have a flair for the dramatics over there. <laughs> but it does bring up an important point. People are harmed every day by things that are published on the internet. Um, something as simple as an unflattering photo can ruin someone's career. Um, people who said things 20 years ago online get that brought up again and their reputation is destroyed. What they're saying is true. People can be hurt by the things that come back again on the internet. So this idea was examined in a, a few cases, but the biggest case is referred to as the Google Spain case. It is a 2014 case and it is all about whether links should be able to be hidden from search results. So um, if I had something that I didn't want other people seeing on, on the internet, it's asking whether I should be able to go to Google and say, hey, I don't want this coming up when people search my name. They were deciding whether that is legal, whether that is acceptable. So they ruled that it was, that was the establishment of the right to be forgotten. They established that people can uh, requisition URLs um, and they define it as inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant or excessive. So if you meet any of those things, you could potentially ask Google to remove your results from search histories. Now, there are limitations on this. It doesn't apply to information that is relevant to the public interest and politicians would have limited access to this right. Because theoretically, when you are voting for someone, putting trust in them, you have a right to know about their past. Now, the problem with this is Google is responsible for policing this. And that did not sit well with a lot of members of the European Union. Google is solely responsible for removing links at their discretion. They now have to honor that new case law that was brought, but there's not a lot of control over how they go about it. There are no checks on this power. And as Americans, that's kind of a red flag to us. It's also kind of a red flag in the European Union. But we're a self-centered country, so let's talk about us again. <laughs> there have been some legislation attempts to establish a right to be forgotten here as well. I'm going to talk about a couple. These two are actually the same. The New York Assembly Bill 5323 and the New York Senate Bill 4561. They were just presented in different parts. This bill would compel search engines like Google to respond to takedown notices from judges and juries on, pen on penalty of $250 a day per instance, plus attorney fees. So if this law were to go into effect, let's do some quick math. 3.5 billion people use Google every day, approximately. For example, let's say 12,000 people requested sites to be taken down, 0.03% of total users. It would cost a minimum of $3.5 million a day if Google did not comply. 
That's a lot of money, even for Google. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, there was a lot of pushback on this bill. And it's not only from large corporations, but also those in the legal community as well. <laughs> Eugene Bullock, who is a lawyer, he had some great quotes, uh, but he was very anti this New York bill. And he said, the New York bill is clearly un unconstitutional under current First Amendment law. And I hope First Amendment law will stay that way, no matter what other countries might have adopted. A little bit of shade, a little bit of shade at Europe there. <laughs> but <laughs> he makes a good point. So the New York legislation failed, failed for a lot of reasons, but that doesn't mean that the right to be forgotten is completely dead in America. Some California legislation was actually successful. So they, they went about it a little bit different and they called it the minor eraser law. So it's the same concept, but it only applies to minors living in California who interact with an online service that they registered for. So you had to like sign in and agree to the terms and conditions. Basically, any minor for any reason can request stuff be taken down. That's completely legal in California as of January 1st, 2015. Now, there is some wiggle room. The minor can be denied if the material was posted by a third party, if the minor was paid to ask for that the removal and if they fail to follow removal communication procedure so if they didn't ask correctly they can be denied without any punishment why this law is still standing a lot of people see it more as a symbol of inaction though because they didn't actually address whether the right to be forgotten is a thing they just kind of said hmm I guess we should let minors delete stuff, but it was very wishy-washy and people kind of had a problem with that. Another example of the legal community kind of refusing to really take a side on this issue is Garcia v. Google. So Cindy Lee Garcia was an actress or attempting to be one. She auditioned for a five second role in Desert Warrior. One of the producers actually dubbed over her audition tape and put it in a film uh, called Innocence of Muslims. And she had to say an offensive line, but it wasn't actually her talking, it was just her acting. And she wasn't actually acting in it because she was trying to act in Desert Warrior. So it's a little convoluted. But this video went viral on YouTube. It had millions of views and Garcia actually started receiving a lot of hate for it. Um, she received death threats, um, stalking concerns. It was just not a great time for her in general. So Garcia went to the course and she says, I want an injunction. I want this video to be taken off the internet. I don't wanna see it. I don't want other people to see it. Well, that brings up the right to be forgotten. And unfortunately for Garcia, it got kind of nowhere. Um, the Copyright Office got involved and they refused to grant her a copyright for her work. They determined that it wasn't um, original enough or separate from the other work. And the Ninth Court of Appeals said that they were sympathetic to her case, but they said in their opinion, because the risk of making a bad law in these circumstances is particularly high, we should aim to decide as narrowly as we can, leading the task of crafting broad new rules for a case in which it is actually necessary to do so. I imagine Garcia wasn't very happy after that, and many who look at the right to be forgotten also weren't happy. It's another symbol of inaction by the government. Now, you've heard about these cases, but why does it matter? Well, actually, 
Forbes did a study on this and in their survey, 88% of Americans support the right to be forgotten in some sense. Most Americans said that they would like to have the ability to control what could be found about them on the internet. Um, this is a privacy issue, but it's also a freedom of speech issue. Our very own Carson King experienced this in real life. If you remember, he went viral for holding a sign and got tons of brand sponsorships and um, all sorts of things, helping charities. Now, a reporter from the Des Moines Register dug up some old tweets that Carson King had tweeted as a teenager and essentially ruined his reputation. He lost sponsorships, he lost brand deals, the whole kind of bubble of fame popped because you can find anything about anyone on the internet. So this isn't only his story. This happens every day to a lot of people. And ethically, I mean, he did say those things. He did say hurtful things. Should he be able to move forward from that? Or should he be held accountable for his actions? That's what the right of the right to be forgotten is all about. But when it comes down to it, there is no right to be forgotten in the abstract. No law can ensure that and no law can be limited to that. Instead, the right this aims to protect is the power to suppress speech, the power to force people on pain of financial ruin to stop talking about other people when some government body decides that they should stop. This is the real threat of the right to be forgotten, censorship. Privacy comes at the expense of expression. And our laws, the constitution, they don't support that. There is no right to be forgotten in the constitution. There is no right to be forgotten anywhere in our lives right now. A forced removal of information from the internet would be a step towards censorship, which is against everything the First Amendment stands for. Expression must win over suppression. So forget about the right to be forgotten. <laughs> okay, I'd like to open it up to questions or discussion. All right, first of all, Eva, thank you so much. We such a fascinating topic and um yes we please please be thinking about your questions all i have the first question yes. here that i will ask um you i got to thinking about your example with carson king and mm -hmm. your california your research on the california law and part of what carson's argument was is, is that the, those things i tweeted i did when i was young mm -hmm. and and the california law seems to address actions that minors take um, you know, when they're young, could something like the California law be adopted more, you know, nationwide to try to address at least some of these concerns we have about uh, our past? I think so. I think it's a great middle ground. Um, I don't believe that it's ever a good idea to be able to kind of delete anything you want um, willy nilly, but I do think it's fair to say that people change from when they're teenagers to when they're adults. I mean, I think about what I believed at 15 is different than what I believe now. Mm -hmm. um, it's unlikely that that law will be adopted nationwide, but I do think that it would be beneficial and kind of give the advantages that the right to be forgotten has um, without censoring too much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if uh, in any of your research you made the distinction between um, content that people created themselves. They tweeted it out, they did something, and then now wish that wasn't available versus um, people caught up in things. Like, uh, you know, for an extreme example, let's say somebody's child was, was uh, killed in a, a gruesome accident and the autopsy. Made it online. 
Um, so it, it's not something they did. They didn't say, you know, we did your fix your there, but they're saying this is causing so much pain to our family to have these two trees surfacing. I wonder if, if there were any cases that kind of tried to draw that line between where the person actually had more agency versus being caused. Yeah, I didn't look at um, that distinction specifically, but we did talk in class about Kobe Bryant's wife. Um, some of the helicopter crash photos were leaked to the press and they're being redistributed. Um, so I think that was under infliction of emotional distress, mm -hmm. right? So there is an argument there um, for any time there is a, a very emotional or disturbing piece of content uh, for it to be removed. Um, of course, uh, Google, YouTube, everything, Bing, um, it's all private companies. So when you sign up and you click that little box and no one actually reads the pages and pages, um, they, they have the ability to remove anything at their discretion already. Um, the right to be forgotten and the lens that I'm looking at uh, is whether the government should be able to force them to do that. So I think if it truly was a, a really gruesome photo. I, if you could tug on people's heartstrings, I think there's a good chance that you could get those removed. Um, but I don't know specifically. Yeah. Why did you choose this topic out of all the topics you could well, this is actually my second choice. <laughs> Don't tell my presentation or my paper. Um, I actually read an article um, about a woman from the 1920s. She was an actress and she was involved in some kind of not good things. And they ended up making a movie about her life and it was publicized and very famous. And she was arguing that she can never really recover from what happened to her because she has to relive it every every day. People um, know about it and are watching the movie and all this. So that's that's where that like right to be right to rehabilitation. And from there, that's where I got to the right to be forgotten. And I think it's it's just really relevant to us now. Um, I mean, COVID, especially, even people that weren't on the internet now have to be. And the internet is not going away anytime soon. So we are past the point where, oh, the internet's new and exciting and blah, blah, blah. It is still new and exciting in the grand scheme of things. But I think it's time that we start kind of defining the rules that we're going to follow moving forward. So that's what initially attracted me to this topic. Any other questions? What was the most surprising thing about your research? <laughs> I don't know if it was necessarily surprising, but the Garcia v. Google case, where the Ninth Court of Appeals basically just said, yeah, that's terrible for you, but we aren't going to do anything because this isn't important enough for us to do something. I thought that was really interesting because at what point is it important enough to do something or to try to define the law? And I mean, that's what those judges have to think about every day, um, trying to do their job and not overstep the bounds. But I, I was just reading it and I was just imagining how she must have felt when they said, oh, well, we aren't going to do anything until a case that's more important comes along mm -hmm. and then we'll address it. So that was kind of sad, but surprising. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So after you done this project and did mm -hmm. all the research, what, what questions do you have next? Like, what does this, um, 
spur in your mind to, to try to learn more about. I, I think just, I need to pay more attention to the terms and conditions and those contracts that we sign all the time without really looking at them. Um, doing this and, and really thinking critically about the internet and privacy, um, I think I've always just kind of like, oh, I've the box because I'm impatient and I want to get to the next thing and keep moving. But I think it would be good for me to actually stop and read sometimes and be like, okay, what am I agreeing to? What does this mean when I say they can have my data? Um, those situations, I think we've all just kind of accepted that, oh, to use the internet, you do that, which is technically true. But um, I think in order for me to be an informed consumer of the internet, I need to have a better idea of what I'm agreeing to when I sign on. So in the long run, Eva, do you believe we're better off if there is not a right to be forgotten? I, I think we would be best off if the California legislation was adopted nationwide and minors have that protection. Um, but I think applying the right to be forgotten to the entire United States, to everyone, it would be censorship. And I, as a journalist and as a researcher, I can't support censorship. So if there's somebody that can prove financial or reputational or true harm from maybe something 25, 30 years ago that's absolutely no longer representative of how they think, act, or feel, do those people have any recourse? Well, I think they could um, try to sue kind of around the problem. Um, infliction of emotional harm, um, privacy towards other, uh, if something was that terrible, um, I think if you made enough noise about it, even if you didn't want to, I think there is potential for things to be removed. I, I don't necessarily know how you go about that. There's no, I'd have to actually look at the law a little more. Julie, do you know? Uh, I'm just kind of related to that. I, I think of Carson King. He tried to get out in front of the story himself mm -hmm. and acknowledge that the statement, you know, like you said, the tweet was mm -hmm. his tweet and sort of own that and, mm -hmm. and apologize that way. And I wonder if maybe someone in that situation could sort of do their own public relations yeah. and PR yeah, get, get out in front of the story if that's a possibility. I think apologies go a long ways. And a sincere apology is rarer than it probably should be in media. And I think that would be a, a great place to start. I think Carson King got in front of it and spilled the beans even before the register decided whether or not they were going to publish the information. Yeah. So he was very aggressive and it, and it helped him. And it didn't seem to hurt yeah. him in the long run. Yeah. yeah. And another interesting thing about the Carson King story is the reporter that initially reported on him, people found old tweets of his mm -hmm. and he was no better. And that kind of bit him too. So no one can really escape. And I mean, even if you aren't trying to be offensive, there's always a chance that something that is accepted now won't be accepted in 30 years. So that's always a thing. I mean, you should not be racist on your social medias and not do purposely bad things, but this is relevant to everyone, even if you aren't actively sharing things that you don't mind if people see. Yeah. 
All right, I have one more follow up if nobody else does. Okay, so I think you did a really excellent job of laying the case out for why the government shouldn't be involved in regulating this information. But you also shared with us the statistic about 88% of Americans want a right to yeah. be forgotten. What role do you think that these private companies like Google and Twitter, et cetera, what role do they have to play in this issue? The problem with these giant companies is they all have, they have monopolized the internet. And while it would be easy to say, oh, just let, let the companies police it. Um, I mean, we can see in Europe, it technically works, but people are really frustrated by that. So I think um, there is an argument to be made for private companies controlling uh, removal. I think for the most part, they choose to stay out of it because it's better for them if they keep their heads down. I mean, we kind of saw that with former President Trump's tweets. Um, and then when Twitter finally stepped in, there was backlash and um, support. It anytime a heavily charged emotional issue, like politics, like um, anything like that, those companies, they thrive off that discourse. So even if it was their responsibility to kind of enforce this right to be forgotten or to remove just hateful things, I don't think they would because from a business model, it's very good for them because when people argue on social media, they're on it more. They're interacting with more ads. They're doing, um, they're commenting more, all of that. Um, and, and that's more, more data for them to use. Mm -hmm. So even if this kind of right to be forgotten is granted to them in America, and even though they kind of have they already have the power to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't foresee large companies like them ever doing it because of the profits lost. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Eva. <laughs> do appreciate you sharing your research with us. If you want more information or if you wanna uh, visit with Eva, I'm sure she'll stick around here for a few minutes. We we have some refreshments in the back that we invite you to help yourself to. And if you want to learn more about the First Amendment, um, please reach out and contact me. I'm Julie Rosa, as I said, or visit our uh, website online on the Greenlee page, and you'll find it if you search First Amendment. So.